Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is esophageal malignancies. I'm going to be addressing esophageal adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, comparing and contrasting the clinical pathologic findings and pathogenesis of these two entities. I'm going to begin with esophageal adenocarcinoma, but that means we have to start with Barrett esophagus, which is the precursor lesion of uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. Now, Barrett esophagus is a complication of gastroesophageal reflux disease in which acid from the stomach enters the esophagus. And in fact, about 10% of patients who have symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux disease will be found to have uh, intestinal metaplasia on endoscopy. So Barrett esophagus is defined as intestinal metaplasia of the esophagus, and it is due to that acid exposure. This injury causes the squamous cells to be replaced by intestinal columnar cells. The process is called transcommitment, and although we don't know the exact mechanism, there are a couple of possibilities. One is that there's a progenitor cell, either in the gastric cardia or in the esophagus itself, that is able to differentiate and become an intestinal columnar cell. Another possibility is that there are circulating stem cells that are able to colonize this injured area and differentiate into intestinal columnar cells. Now, intestinal metaplasia on its own is not necessarily a bad thing. It's providing some protection. But as you recall, metaplasia increases the risk of progression to dysplasia, and dysplasia increases our risk of progression to adenocarcinoma. So uh, we only see about 0.2 to 1% of individuals per year will progress from intestinal metaplasia to epithelial dysplasia. But once they do progress to epithelial dysplasia, this significantly increases the risk of adenocarcinoma. So there's about a 30-fold increase in risk of adenocarcinoma compared to patients who have no Barrett esophagus at all. There's increased risk with increased duration of symptoms and patient age. What do we see? So the endoscopist will see salmon pink tongues of glandular mucosa extending from the gastroesophageal junction. On, uh, this will be uh, interspersed with tongues of normal uh, squamous mucosa, which has a light pink color. Now, microscopically, we're going to see goblet cells. Goblet cells belong in the intestine, they don't belong in the stomach, and they don't belong in the esophagus. So let's take a look first at the endoscopy. Here is a classic image. We're looking down from the mouth towards the gastroesophageal junction. And you can see here we have the normal healthy squamous mucosa, which is light pink due to that squamous uh, epithelium. And by contrast, we have the salmon pink band here. Uh, this is that glandular mucosa. So this is what uh, the endoscopist would see. Let's see what a resection specimen will look like. This has been uh, fixed in uh, formalin. You can see here we have our gastroesophageal junction. Uh, and here is the gastric mucosa. This uh, erythematous reddened area here is the Barrett uh, esophagus or the intestinal metaplasia with a thin strip of healthy squamous uh, mucosa at the top. Now I'm going to show you what we see histologically first looking at what we see uh, in uh, a normal uh, gastroesophageal junction for comparison. Here you can see we have our squamous mucosa, and adjacent to that we have our gastric mucosa without goblet cells. By contrast, here we see Barrett esophagus with intestinal metaplasia, and what will clue you in are these goblet cells. They're called goblet cells because this drop of light gray-blue mucin, uh, which is uh, sitting here above the nucleus, looks like a wine goblet. And this is an image that you really should be able to recognize. I'm sure you will see this on step exams, shelf exams, uh, throughout uh, your examining uh, lifetime. So be sure you can recognize this. And then just again, compare and contrast. Normal healthy with normal gastric mucosa, no goblet cells. Uh, Barrett esophagus here with intestinal metaplasia with goblet cells. Now again, the reason we uh, care about this is not the intestinal metaplasia per se, but because of the risk of progression to dysplasia and then on to adenocarcinoma. So let's take a look here. Uh, this is an individual with Barrett esophagus. And what we can see is that these are dysplastic glands. We can see here's a goblet cell. Here are another couple right here as well as here. So this is intestinal metaplasia. This uh, biopsy, uh, actually it's an excision, comes from the gastroesophageal junction. So we should not be seeing goblet cells in that area. But I want to draw your eyes here to this prominent cytologic atypia uh, that we see here with variation in uh, cell size and shape. This very large, uh, dark nucleus here. Uh, we have loss of 
vascularity here. So this is dysplasia, and this is why you will be doing surveillance on uh, patients uh, who have Barrett esophagus, because although only a small proportion will progress, uh, once they do it, it becomes quite alarming. And in fact, this uh, particular specimen even has invasive adenocarcinoma. So here's a gland that is uh, showing some dysplasia, but is not invasive carcinoma. You can recognize that by the rounded, smooth uh, border. But here we have these angulated glands that are invading into the surrounding tissue, uh, causing a desmoplastic reaction. So we have uh, in this one specimen, um, we have Barrett uh, esophagus, uh, high-grade dysplasia, and invasive adenocarcinoma. But I've gotten ahead of myself. We haven't even started talking about esophageal adenocarcinoma, so let's rewind and talk about esophageal adenocarcinoma. So almost all cases of esophageal adenocarcinoma arise in a background of Barrett esophagus, and incidence is rising worldwide. It used to be that squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus was much more common than esophageal adenocarcinoma, but those are now about equal. And in fact, in some regions, esophageal adenocarcinoma surpasses the incidence of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma. Risk factors include obesity, uh, because of the increased incidence of gastroesophageal reflux disease in these individuals, uh, smoking and radiation, uh, as well as diets low in fresh fruits and vegetables, perhaps due to the antioxidants uh, found in these foods. Interestingly, some serotypes of Helicobacter pylori are protective against esophageal adenocarcinoma. This is because they decrease uh, gastric acid, which reduces the injury, reduces uh, the tendency towards Barrett esophagus. Patients with esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, will present with pain and difficulty swallowing. Uh, and this can progress from a normal diet to uh, a liquid-only diet. Uh, and patients uh, may then uh, experience weight loss due to lack of nutrition or due to disseminated disease. Other presentations include hematemesis, chest pain, and vomiting. Now, because the lymphatics in the esophagus are found in the lamina propria, we tend to get early metastases to lymph nodes. By contrast, in the rest of the gastrointestinal tract, the lymphatics are beneath the muscularis mucosa, so tumor has to invade a little further along. Because of uh, this early uh, invasion, tumors are typically advanced at diagnosis with an overall five-year survival of less than 25%. So again, this is why you will want to do surveillance uh, endoscopy on your patients with Barrett esophagus, because you want to be able to detect the lesion early when you can do intramucosal uh, resection uh, and catch the disease at an early uh, stage and save the patient's life. So the pathogenesis uh, of this will be early uh, TP53 in CDKN2A uh, loss of function, either through allelic loss through mutation or through epigenetic silencing due to hypermethylation. Now, as you recall, CDKN2A encodes uh, the P15, P16, and ARF proteins. P16 uh, plays a role, as you will recall, in retinoblastoma uh, tumor suppressors. Uh, what P16 does is it inhibits uh, cyclin-dependent kinase 4 and 6, uh, thereby uh, blocking uh, this uh, RB tumor suppressor uh, protein uh, from, uh, and supporting them from going into uh, the G1 phase. If you knock out P16, you will no longer have uh, CDK4, CDK6 being inhibited, uh, and RB is able uh, to then uh, go through uh, G1 phase, uh, taking along any mutations along with it. ARF plays a role by inhibiting MDM2. As you recall, what MDM2 does is that it binds to P53 and degrades it. So if you lose ARF, MDM2 is not inhibited. It attaches to P53, degrades it, and you no longer have our guardian of the genome taking care of your genome. Uh, with progression, you get later additional mutations, and there's increased risk uh, with increased duration of symptoms, increased patient age, and longer Barrett uh, mucosa. So that's increased risk of adenocarcinoma in this setting. So what do we see morphologically? So because these are rising in uh, background of Barrett esophagus, they're associated with the distal third of the esophagus. Early lesions will be flat or they can be raised, and they will be in a background of Barrett esophagus. Later lesions can be exophytic masses or ulcerated masses, and they may show diffuse infiltration of the esophagus or uh, a very deep invasion. And most of these will produce mucin and form glands. And because they're in the distal third of the esophagus, they tend to metastasize to the gastric and celiac lymph nodes. So let's take a look uh, at a um, 
uh, what we see in uh, esophageal adenocarcinoma. Again, here we have our Barrett esophagus with our gastroesophageal junction. Here is uh, an adenocarcinoma, which is uh, ulcerated and invading deeply, and it's arising in this background uh, of Barrett esophagus. Now, the tinctorial differences between these two are that this is fixed in formaldehyde, whereas this is a fresh resection specimen. And then on histology, uh, we're going to see, as I showed you earlier, these invasive uh, glands. Uh, or you can see here uh, another appearance uh, where you have this mucin uh, being formed in these back-to-back -back glands. Uh, this is from the Robbins textbook. So that finishes up our discussion of adenocarcinoma. Let's move on to squamous cell carcinoma. So this is more common uh, in men than in women, about a four to one ratio. And there are some countries where there's a particularly high incidence, and I've listed those for you uh, here. Uh, the presentation of squamous cell carcinoma is very similar to what we see in esophageal adenocarcinoma. I want to take some time to discuss the risk factors because there are many more uh, to squamous cell carcinoma than to adenocarcinoma. So the first of these will be alcohol and tobacco use, which are synergistic and which may account for the uh, higher incidence uh, of esophageal squamous cell carcinoma in men compared to women. We also know that poverty and diets uh, low in fresh fruits and vegetables are associated with squamous cell carcinoma. These uh, probably uh, correlate together. Caustic esophageal uh, injury can also uh, lead to uh, squamous cell carcinoma. This can be seen uh, in the setting of individuals who may attempt suicide by lye ingestion, which causes uh, injury to the esophagus. Uh, they may develop a squamous cell carcinoma later in life. Now, there are two uh, entities I want to discuss. Uh, these are often sort of glossed over quickly in a textbook. I want to take the time to give you some context. So one of the risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus is something called plumber vinson syndrome, which is uh, characterized by a triad of dysphagia, iron deficiency anemia, and something called an esophageal web. Uh, and uh, this tends to arise in middle-aged women, and we do not know the pathogenesis. I'm going to show you what an esophageal web looks like, because to me, I have a hard time envisioning this, and that makes it hard for me to remember this uh, syndrome. A second entity that's associated with squamous cell carcinoma is achalasia, and this is a motility disorder due to deterioration of the myenteric plexus. This causes loss of peristalsis of the esophagus and is the inability to relax the lower esophageal uh, sphincter. What will happen is then you will then get upstream dilation of the esophagus, and I'm going to show you an image of that as well. Frequent consumption of very hot beverages is a risk factor, uh, and this means really hot. So that may account for uh, some of the risk factor we see in the uh, higher incidence countries where they uh, tend to drink very hot tea or very hot coffee. Uh, radiation, perhaps for thoracic malignancy, is also associated with an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. So here are two images of the two disease processes I mentioned that are associated uh, with squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus. This is a barium uh, swallow showing a plumber vinson syndrome, and this is the esophageal web. So it is a protrusion of mucosa, uh, which is at about a 90 degree angle uh, to the uh, underlying mucosa. Uh, and you can see we've got some dilation as well and a filling defect uh, downstream from that. And it's not clear uh, what causes this esophageal web to form. Here is achalasia. This is the classic bird uh, beak deformity. So here we have loss of our uh, activity or myenteric plexus. That lower esophageal uh, sphincter can't open. So it's very narrow here, and upstream you get this dilation, and perhaps exposure uh, to toxins uh, in food or, or whatever is, uh, increases the risk of squamous cell carcinoma. So the pathogenesis is not as clear uh, in squamous cell carcinoma as it is in esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, we know that SOX2, which is involved in stem cell self-renewal, can be amplified, and we can also see cyclin D1 overexpression, as well as loss of function of TP53, uh, CDH1, uh, notch, and, and NOTCH1. Uh, and tobacco and alcohol, as I mentioned, uh, synergize to increase risk. What do we see morphologically? Uh, about 50% of these are in the middle third of the esophagus, compared to esophageal adenocarcinoma, which tends to be in that distal third. Squamous dysplasia uh, will appear as gray-white plaques, uh, whereas invasive carcinoma can be polypoid or ulcerated and fungating. Uh, it may be uh, diffusely infiltrating or, again, deeply invasive. Most of them show moderate to well differentiation and, like esophageal adenocarcinoma, tend to metastasize early to lymph nodes. 
Where they metastasize depends on where in the esophagus they arise. So if the squamous cell carcinoma is arising in the upper third, we'll see it in the cervical lymph nodes, in the middle third, the mediastinal, paratracheal, and tracheobronchial lymph nodes, and then the lower third, we'll see it in the gastric and the celiac nodes. Let's see what we see uh, grossly. Uh, just to compare and contrast, we have our squamous cell carcinoma here in that middle third with a polypoid lesion. This is a fixed tumor again, uh, so you can see the squamous mucosa. And by contrast, here again we have our uh, adenocarcinoma. Now histologically, uh, here's a low power view just to uh, give you the overall. You can see here we have this fungating mass. Uh, which is going to be friable uh, and necrotic at the top. And this uh, particular lesion is invading deeply into the muscularis propria. So when you think about the fact that your lymphatics are going to be uh, way up in here, uh, we can say with a, a fair degree of certainty that this particular lesion is probably uh, involving lymph nodes uh, when we see this now. And then just on higher magnification, uh, we can see here the invasion into the surrounding soft tissue with a desmoplastic response. Uh, we've got these uh, irregular uh, borders and uh, jagged edge. That's uh, a clue that this is invasive. And then the clue that this is a squamous cell carcinoma uh, is that we see it's doing what squamous cell carcinomas do. So squames uh, are the, they, as they mature to the top of the epithelium, they are shed off. These have nowhere to be shed off, so they're going to form this necrotic uh, cystic uh, structure. And we see no mucin, which would be something that would lead us to uh, think of an adenocarcinoma. Now, this is just a compare and contrast uh, of these two entities looking at the site, the main risk factors, and the precursor lesions. And then, as always, just uh, finishing with a couple of questions. So, how are they similar? What is it they have in common? And then, of course, the, the next question is, how are they different? Uh, and then the question would be, why do both of these malignancies tend to metastasize early to lymph nodes? Uh, as always, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. I hope you have found this useful.